it's an honor to be here. Um, what do I do? I got it. I got it. Okay. So I'm going to talk about economic models. And for me, uh, a model is going to be the same thing it is for Andrew Gelman. It's a probability distribution over a sequence. So here's physics according to the great physicist Richard Feynman. <clears throat> Think about some, this is Feynman's metaphor. Think about someone who does not know the rules but observes actions taken by two people who are playing chess. Observes some of the actions. And from these limited observations on the player's moves, the observer's job is to infer the rules of the game of chess. So Feynman saw that as a metaphor for how physicists learn about the laws of physics. So Feynman's uh, chess metaphor is close to a literal description of what economic scientists do. This is going to be my theme. So but in economics, <clears throat> sometimes the rules of the game change midstream. Congress is doing things this week and next week that may change some of those. So what we want to do is we want to detect when rules of the game have changed and how. And sometimes we even want to recommend changes in the rules of the game. So <clears throat> for economics, it's not enough for a central bank. Uh, it's not sufficient. It's necessary for a central bank to, dete to detect patterns using neural nets and random forests. Because a central bank wants to know what's going to happen under policy interventions that uh, change rules in unprecedented ways. Unprecedented means they're not in the data. And uh, <clears throat> because experiments aren't possible here, and you don't want to live in a country where there's an experiment being done, usually. I'll give you a, come and see me afterwards, I'll tell you some countries you could go visit where there's an experiment. <laughs> So economics, uh, data, data analysis, no matter how sophisticated, has to be tied into theory. That's the difference between Kepler and Newton. If you read St St Steven Weinberg's book, Explaining the World, about physics. OK, so I told you uh, economics has a tight definition of, uh, of a game. Uh, it's due to John von Neumann. So here's his definition of a game. It's a list of players. You, you know this definition if you play soccer, football. It's a list of players. It's a list of legitimate actions available to each player. It's a description of how rewards or payoffs to each player depend on the actions of all players. That's a mouthful. So what my payoff depends on what all my teammates do and what all my opponents do. And finally, it's a description of who chooses what, when, a timing protocol. And timing matters. So what do economic scientists do? And I could change economics to any kind of scientist. So four things. First, you observe. Collapse some observations. And second thing you do is you detect patterns. Sometimes that involves imposing patterns. And the next thing is you build theories to explain the patterns. And then the final thing you do is you predict. I'll come back and what you may, what I might mean by predict. So here's a model. So <coughs> um, Andrew Gelman uses the same, and I. Bayesian uses the same. Probability distribution over a sequence of observations, hidden states, indexed by some parameters. That's what I mean by a model. Could use the language stochastic process. So economic scientists, you observe, you detect patterns. So I'm going to say detecting patterns, that's fitting a non-structural or non-causal model. And it's got some parameters delta. I'm going to call those, those are non-structural parameters.
And we use Python and Pandas and Scikit-learn to do that. That's an essential step. You build theories. <laughs> and um, you know, both your pattern recognition and your theories, they're both models. But they have different, different parameters. Theta, I'm going to call those causal parameters. And then the final thing you do is you predict. So what you might predict is you might, you might predict uh, assuming the pattern is going to stay the same. Um, so you might just have estimated the parameters, delta or theta. That's what you want the model. Now you have a machine for uh, conditioning on data and predicting into the future. That's under a, a given historical regime. And it's almost as if Feynman was saying that was enough for him. But <clears throat> economics, often we want to do it under alternative regimes because we're going to change the rules. You know, you know when you know, Deng Xiaoping in China changed the rules and um, made China look a lot less like Venezuela and a lot more like the United States. Um, so we want to study what happens under alternative regimes. Um, okay, so I'm going to tell you what observations are. I'm going to call them Y's. And I'm going to index them by time. And those are my observations. And Y is a vector. Okay, pattern recognition. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, a non-causal model, uh, I'm going to have a history of observations, call it Y to the T. I mean, a history of observation, that's just going to be a probability of tomorrow, so y, conditioned on the history up to time t, and some parameters. I'm going to call that a non-causal model, and um, lots of things that you know about. Could be a, it's basically a nonlinear function. <clears throat> and then A is going to be, um, that's, a, the model is going to yield me um, an innovation or shock process. It's going gonna, it's gonna to have a notion of news or information. That's what A is. And notice that's just the difference between Y and what I could predict basis on past data. That's, that's information. Um, and then economists do um, some of the last thing is they form impulse response functions. They ask if I feed a sequence of shocks in, how are the dynamics of the Y's going to look like? <coughs> Engineers do that too. That's pattern recognition. And um, okay, prediction. Um, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna iterate the transition law and get conditional distributions of the future. And uh, they're not going to be point estimates. They're not going to say if uh, you pass the Trump tax bill, uh, GNP is going to grow at four percent. It's going to be probability distributions characterize the uncertainty. And that's what physicists want to do too. They want to characterize what we know and what we don't know. And they don't know a lot of things, and we know even less. And we should be honest about that. So, so um, pattern recognition. <clears throat> so this is hard for macroeconomics because it's difficult because uh, if, if economy's growing, um, we lose two of our favorite, naturally, we lose two of our favorite machines for learning. The law of large numbers and the central limit theorem because it's growing because there's it's non-stationarity so we have to do something to induce stationarity so we can activate one of those laws um, we, so we have controversial ways of doing that it's also true as some laws of economics change over time and I mentioned Deng Xiaoping we have to be able to detect um, and recognize in our pattern recognition when they may have changed And then we need theory to extract the stationary components and make inferences about them. So my friend Lars Hansen at Chicago is a big leader in that. Okay, so now I'm gonna tell you about theory. I'm done talking about pattern recognition because I shouldn't be talking about pattern recognition here. I should be learning. And actually, I, I, I go to the gym every day and I watch YouTube videos, often of Pi Data Conference. And, I, and I, I'm, a, I'm thrilled to be here because many of the stars of those YouTube videos are on this program. Um, okay, so now I'm going to tell you about theory. So I'm going to tell you about um, abstract version of economic theory. And um, 
<clears throat> I'm going to make this simple because I want to keep the vector short, but you can lengthen the vectors by changing 2 to n. Okay, so I'm going to have a state and I have some controls. So the states, a, a state is what Laplace meant. It's a complete description of the current position of the system. So my state is going to be, have some x1s. Those are the states for player 1. x2, those are the states for player 2. And xn, those are states for nature. So nature is going to do some stuff like weather, stuff like, well, maybe we affect weather. So I'm going to think of those. Um, that may have been politically incorrect, but, but anyway. So, so, so x is a, is a vector, it's a state. And there's some things that are um, controlled partly by the two players, u1 and u2. So there's two players in this game. And you can lengthen that to n. So then there's going to be some shocks hitting the system. And those, those, are, uh, those are shocks actually hitting the physical system. Uh, shocks to all sorts of stuff. Um, you know, some come from weather, some come from um, events abroad. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let them be uh, IID. My shocks are going to be IID. And then, I, then the, the content of the theory, there's going to be a law of motion. Um, I chose to use difference equations. We often use differential equations. So the state next period is a function of the state this period, the whole state. The whole vector of controls, so like what, what you do and what I do and everybody else does in the use. The shocks that are pinging on the system. And they're conditioned on the thetas. The thetas are the vectors uh, of parameters. And then the second thing is the UTs, they're going to they're gonna end up somehow, they're going to be, the UTs, the decisions of the players are going to be functions of the state. That's a feedback law. What else could they be? Uh, and they're going to depend on the parameters. So my parameters theta are going to influence that law of motion, and they're going to ultimately influence the g's. So this is only a piece of a theory, because I have to, the natural thing is, ask Feynman's question. Um, well, <clears throat> I have imperfect observations on the x's and the u's, but how are the g's being determined? How can I explain the g's? Those are the decision rules. You know, so I want a theory of what players are doing. OK, so here's what I'm going to do. It. I'm going to say uh, uh, players do what they want. That's economics. Players do what they want. So what do they want? So I'm going to tell you. I'm going to, I'm going to endow them with some preferences. So remember, von Neumann said, I've got to tell you payoffs, what players are trying to maximize. So I'm going to, I'm going to, this is a dynamic thing, I'm going to endow each player with a, with a dynamic program, discounted dynamic program. So each player is going to have a, a function, R1 or R2, that summarizes how their payoffs, R, at time t, depend on the state and the control. You think of what else could they depend on, you know? the situation I have and what I do. So there's two of those, or if there's a whole bunch of players, there's N of them. There's all these players, and those are their objectives. And um, I've, I've restricted that, just like a control engineer would do. It's taken from control engineering. The conditional expectation of that discounted sum of those payoffs, that's what the guy wants to do. And what he wants to choose is a decision rule, u, as a function of the state that's going to make that as big as possible. That's what he wants to do. And so uh, the outcome of the theory is going to be a set of decision rules that solve that max problem. So if you're an engineer or mathematician, uh, you'll, see, you'll say, this is not a well-posed problem. I haven't told you enough about this to write a Python program. I've told you pieces of it. So, you know, kind of economics I like to do is if you can't write a Python program, you're a bullshitter. <laughs> okay, so now, so I'm not done. Okay, so, and now, okay, so now a theory and observations. So the measurements, um, we, we, don't, we don't always get to see the whole state. 
This is Feynman again. We don't always get to see the whole controls. What we do is we, our whys are a function. There's some perhaps nonlinear, noisy function of the states and the decisions. Fox News came into my head right now. Or, uh, you know, you, we get noisy, we get some information, we get, or anything, New York Times or Wall Street Journal, you get noisy signals on what's actually going on, and ADAs are gonna be some more shocks. Okay, so now I'm gonna tell you about um, causal mo models. There's two problems. And this is straight out of, I, I learned this at a, con a, a physics and engineering, con a chemistry conference. Two, mo two problems with causal models. There's a direct problem, and there's the inverse problem. The direct problem is you give me theta and m, the measurements, and I'm gonna simulate the observations. You give me a model, I can generate observations. You give me all that stuff. Uh, the inverse problem is you give me the observations, and I, I wanna infer a bunch of stuff. I wanna infer the, the structural parameters, I wanna infer the hidden states, and I want, to hit, uh, I want to infer the uh, hidden control variables, perhaps. I want to infer all that stuff, back all that stuff out. And this is a very Bayesian or stand view. I'm taking a symmetric view about, I'm forced to. That's the inverse problem. Okay. So an equivalent state, uh, there's an equivalent statement of the uh, inverse problem. Given a good fitting non-causal model, I want to infer those things. Okay. So now, I have to complete, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to complete the uh, description of the game. And even with what I've said now, there's multiple games that I can write down with that environment. Because I haven't told you about timing protocols and, and what the different players are doing, assuming about what the other players are doing. So we're in a game, uh, my decision rule ought to depend on what your, my best decision rule depends on what your decision rule is. Think about any game you play. Your decision rule, one thing that's vital to you is the law of motion of the whole system and what the opponents are doing, their strategies. So my strategy depends on your strategy. So we're gonna be thrust into a fixed point. Okay, so here's the, so I'm gonna tell you something called Markov Perfect. This is closely, this is an extension of an idea of uh, John Nash. So player I, I'm gonna choose, I'm gonna uh, choose the decision rule GI, that's mine, to maximize what I care about. And subject to the following law of motion, I'm gonna, the law, the, I'm gonna say I know the law of motion F, I know how it depends on my de decisions, you, my moves, and your moves. And now I'm going to assume I know U minus I means that's yours. That's your decision rule. I'm going to assume when I make my, choose my decision rule, I take your decision rule as given. And now it's a complete problem. It's now a complete dynamic programming problem. It's no longer bullshit. Um, it's a complete problem. You can, you can write a Python program. You write that program, Python program, and what you find is strategic interdependence. You find that my GI, G minus I means and it's the, the other guys. Or if there's a whole bunch of players, it means everybody else's. Uh, my decision rule depends on what everybody else's decision rule is. And they have a symmetric equation. And a Nash equilibrium, or a Markov perfect equilibrium, is a fixed point of that. That's, a comp that's one game. Um, and now it's a tight model. And um, now we could think of this as a model of an industry uh, where there's a bunch of producers, um, Python and Julia, stuff like that, competitors. Um, I'll give you another, another, another game. This is called Stockelberg. So I'm gonna change, change the timing. And this is gonna change the outcome. So in a way, I'm, ch I'm changing the rules of the game. And what's gonna happen is the, is the final theory is gonna change. So here's the deal. Player one chooses first, G1 first. 
not simultaneously. See, that fixed point is those guys are essentially choosing simultaneously, and it settles down to a different. Player one chooses first, goes first, and then player two chooses G2 knowing G1. So G2 is a, the decision rule is a function of G1, but now player one knows what that function is. So player one can manipulate player two's decision rule because he has that first mover advantage. That's it. So the timing, and that leads to different outcomes. So it leads to, you know, it's a different game. Looks very similar, but, but just by changing the timing protocol, I change the outcome. And here's another game, Monopoly. There's these two players. I, uh, I have a single player choose both of them. So this could be a model of a family. Guess what? There's a husband and a wife. What do they do? So this is, this is one where, uh, not to get personal, this is a model where Carolyn chooses what both Carolyn and Tom do. Um, that's a monopoly. That's, um, it's, and it's different outcomes. And actually, in some sense, it's a better outcome. Okay, so there's other games. There's perfect competition. There's a Pareto planner. There's all sorts of things, even with this setup. So one thing, so now I'm thinking about Feynman again. So our job is to figure out from the data which game's being used. So now, notice what I've done. Change those games, I change the model. The name of a model is a likelihood function. You know, with enough structure, I give that to Andrew Gelman and, and Stan and his team and pray if something comes out. Okay. So, so the so alternative games uh, define alternative causal models, and then we want to compare models. That's what economists are supposed to be doing. That's what the that's what the Federal Trade Commission or antitrust is trying to do. Is there really you know? Is there, there's first class economists trying to do that? Is how, how can you tell whether there's really a collusion in industry? It's hard to do. Okay. So why do we want causal models? And now, this could be a talk in any, anything. So, so you recognize this. Uh, dimension reduction. The theory asserts that the parameters delta of the non-causal model are actually functions of the parameters of the causal model, theta. And theta might be a lot smaller dimension than delta. Um, so anytime you can reduce the dimension of parameters, do it. Um, okay, the other is uh, interpreting the shocks. The shocks in the uh, uh, non-causal model are functions of the shocks in the causal model. You can't interpret them unless you have the causal model. And then finally thing is policy evaluation. When we're done with this, we want to we wanna ask what's the optimal game? We want to we want to devise optimal policy. And that's going to lay an optimum problem on a function. Tell me the, tell me the best game to play. OK. Uh, so, so this is beyond Feynman economics. Um, so we want to study experiments that may amount to changing the rules of the game. So I said that. So models, so OK. OK, so finally. I just say I've imposed. This is some people say this is right-wing economics because it says uh, people kind of know what they're doing and they're acting in their own best interest. I don't. I think it's left-wing economics. So one thing is I've imposed in that spirit. I've imposed communism of models. So what do I mean by that? Um, the agents inside the model have a prediction problem just like the analyst does. They're trying to predict where the system's going and embedded in their dynamic programming problem is a prediction problem. And how are they predicting? They're using a stochastic process in prediction theory and they're using the same model that the analyst is building. It's a big fixed point. So if you ask, uh, do people disagree about probability distributions? No. Okay, so that's an incredible assumption but scientifically, it's, it's a dimension reduction assumption. Because if I give everybody in this room a different model, I've proliferated parameters. 
and uh, I've gone into I've gone dimension uh, uh, expansion. You can't estimate it. Um, okay, so that's called rational expectations. Okay, so then okay. Oh yeah, here's the deal. Uh, the CEO of uh, Quant Econ, John Sikorsky. We have many examples. I'll, j I'll just tell you what we do in Quant Econ, because we fall short of uh, where we want to do. We have a whole bunch of problems of uh, direct problems. Um, we have far fewer solutions of, of inverse problems, and we're uh, we're we're being either shrewd or lazy. We're waiting for Stan um, to do uh, some things. Okay, now I'm supposed to do this. Oh, I do allow. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. What do I do? Okay, so I just want to show you something. So we have these lectures. So th this is this is kind of propaganda. I don't know. What, I'm not a. What do I do? Oh, this is great. You're observing real-time learning. Because <laughs> I'm a Linux person. Okay. And um, okay. Uh, okay, so, so we have this uh, website, which is is called Quantitative Economics, and this is, this is all a stunt. This is the deal. We simultaneously teach um, this kind of economics and Python. And uh, every time we write economics, we write Python. Every time we do Python, we do economics. So here's some L linear quadratic dynamic programming problems, and uh, we have an overview, and then we, we teach you what that is, and then we look, look at this, law of motion, all this stuff. And then we do a classic model, and then we show you the Python code, and then, uh, and then that's it. And then, what do I do? Okay, so now I want to go back to, uh, I, just, I, I want to stop now, and I want to show you one thing. How do I kill this? Oh, he's a Linux guy, too. And then we'll go to. I have one last slide. I got to show okay. you. Okay. Oh, okay. I good. Think we just gotta. Okay. So I just go all the way down. Okay. So I'm just gonna. I'm gonna conclude with fun. So, am I saying anything new, or was Feynman saying anything new? And I'm just gonna go back. Ancient Chinese proverb. This is from 2,500 years ago. This is a message. The government has a strategy. The people have a counter strategy. That's it. <laughs> Okay, we have a few minutes for any questions. Tom, are you okay to take a few questions? If no, that's okay. I think we're we've got yeah. We have about um, a few minutes. Is there does anyone have any questions, comments? Anybody? Okay, I think we're. I th oh. I tell my daughter, I have to be there. <laughs> 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 this time I don't miss it. <laughs> so I'm so glad, and it was so refreshing um, to hear you. So that's nice. Uh, so I want to tell you what. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so that's uh, really nice. So I want to tell you my daughter. So in, in, uh, in, uh, in my daughter was in uh, fourth grade. I'm on TV at the, at the nightly news talking about unemployment. They come and interview me. And, uh, I, and in my office, and after the, after the, so I do what I think is a good job. The phone rings as soon as it's my daughter, uh, Anne, at fourth grade, and she says, hey, Dad, I just saw your talk. Uh, after I saw your talk, I don't, see if, I don't feel so bad about the B minus I got on my talk in class. <laughs> Okay, any, did you, here, we could. Yeah, so, um, so we've had some success. Um, the, the truth is you have to do about half as much of each. That's just the truth. 
So one strategy that works well is if, if we can teach some basic economics where we, do so, where we teach it with linear algebra and stuff like that, and then uh, show them that, and then turn on the Python, it really ignites them. And you know, it can change people's lives. First thing is, they get jobs. They get summer jobs. Uh, and um, whereas, so, so lots of, uh, I hate to say this, uh, lots, so lots of schools, economics gets pressure to uh, compete with uh, basket weaving. So you get, uh, you enlarge your class and uh, lower the requirements so you don't use as much math as they had in high school. And then uh, guess what? They don't learn anything. So, but, and they, uh, guess what? They don't get summer jobs. But like, we've taught a couple of classes where they, where they do Python and they all get summer jobs and they, so you can change a few lives. So I'm optimistic. <laughs> We're all for changing lives. Okay. Okay. I think I think we're done. We'll um, we'll have the, our second keynote after lunch, and um, everyone enjoy your sessions. Good stuff.